Welcome back to Be The Ram Global Fellowship. I am Pastor Coach Anthony McKissick Sr. And this is your virtual Bible study. I'm glad that you chose to fellowship with us. There's so many of other places that you could have gone to hear God's word, but I am very happy and I feel special that you chose us. Let us pray. God, thank you for this moment. Please be a blessing to us and through us. Let your word resonate and reside in our spirits. Let something be said and learned today that will change not only our lives, but the lives of all those around us for a long time, if not forever. Thank you for what you're doing in this ministry. Thank you for the new growth. We appreciate the two new members from Texas, and we just love growing and knowing that you have positioned us for a reason. Please let this be a blessing to somebody. Let us all clear our minds and our hearts. Forgive us for our continuous sins. 
grant us mercy and grace. In your mighty name we pray, amen and amen. Hey guys, once again, thank you for coming back. We're still on the book of Esther. I'm going to give you a quick recap. Check out the recap from last week. Chapters 1 and 2 of Esther, and you have one queen that's put out. You have a drunk king and his drunk homeboys. God is not mentioned, and they're making bad decisions. And now you have a niece of Mordecai, who's a Jew, who's keeping her identity a secret. She's not letting the king know who she is, which kind of makes me think, do you really know who you married to? Like, are, are we married to people and don't really know who we're married to? Like, anyway, whole nother story, whole nother day. But then Mordecai always checked on his niece. So he just stood on his guard. Stay on your guard, folks. If you're watching out for somebody, stay on your guard. The devil's busy. So as he was on his post, as he was on his guard, checking on his people, he heard the men who should be guarding the king talking junk about them. Are we going to take him out? We mad. He reported it immediately, expeditiously to his niece who took care of the situation. That's where we're going to stop. We're going to okay, I'm not going to waste your time. We're going to get right back into the word. We're starting at Esther chapter 3. We finished one and two. It got good. It got great. And I am excited to uh, see what we're going to learn here today. So let me share my screen. Once again, we're going to jump right back into Esther chapter three. I am reading from the uh, ERV. I'm going to go to the ERV. That's the one that we've been reading for from the last week. So I'm going to give you tidbits throughout this lesson here. Esther 3, humans plan to destroy the Jews. After these things happened, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadeth the Agathite. The king promoted Haman and gave him a place of honor more important than any of the other leaders. All the king's leaders at the king's gate would have to bow down and give honor to Haman. This is what the king commanded them to do, but Mordecai refused to bow down and give honor to Haman. Then the king's leaders at the gate asked Mordecai, why don't you obey the king's command and bow down to Haman? Verse four, day after day, the king's leaders spoke to Mordecai, but he refused to obey the command to bow down to Haman. So they told Haman about it. They wanted to see what Haman would do about Mordecai. Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. Pause. Yeah, we hit it with that pause again. Once again, you have now Haman, a man is elevated by the king. He's a bad man. He has foul intentions, but he is elevated by the king. Sometimes bad people will be elevated. It is what it is. But just because they are elevated does not mean that you have to bow down. You got to stop bowing down, giving out, and giving in to everything that the culture tells you you have to do. So Mordecai was a man of his faith. He was a Jew. He wasn't a perfect man. Remember that God isn't even mentioned in this, uh, in this book. But he was strong enough to say, you know what? I don't care what the king says. I don't care what Haman the hangman says. I don't care about none of that. I'm not bowing to him because he's not my God. But you got to be the same way. You got to understand that just because somebody tell you that man's in charge don't mean you got to go sucking up. You don't have to suck up to come up. Be yourself. Be who God called you to be. Let's continue to read here. Verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai refused to bow down to him and give honor to him, he was very angry. Haman had learned that Mordecai was a Jew, but he was not satisfied to kill only Mordecai. He also wanted to find a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, and all of Xerxes' kingdom. See, here is an example of one man 
making a decision that affects everybody in his family. See, guys, things that you do does affect people in your house. You can't act like your sin is just your sin because your sin affects everyone. I'm not saying he was sinning because he wasn't, but his decisions affected all of his people. Now you take an angry Haman who couldn't just be satisfied with getting back at, at uh, Mordecai. He had to get back at all of Mordecai's people. See, this is where he went wrong. Sometimes the devil would have been better off if he just came for you. But when he came for all of your people, that's where he fell short. Okay? In the 12th year of King Xerxes' rule, in the first month, the month of Nisan, Haman threw lots of lots to choose a special day of, uh, uh, excuse me, Haman threw lots to choose a special day and month. And the 12th month, the, t the month of Adar was chosen. Lots is basically like a rolling dice. So the man was so cocky, he said, pretty much, I'm a roll of dice. And whatever that number lands on, that's when I'm going to kill the Jews. Then Haman came to King Xerxes and said, King Xerxes, there's a certain group of people scattered among the people in the provinces of your kingdom. They keep themselves separate from other people. Their customs are different from those of all of other people, and they don't obey the king's laws. It is not right for the king to allow them to continue to live in your kingdom. Stop, Paul, stop. So the man clearly said they're scattered out. They're not like, it's not many of them, but then he had to throw in and say, well, they don't obey your laws. He don't even know the rest of the people, okay? But he's taking the, the, angst, the, like the angst that he has against Mordecai, and he's just going to come to the king with half of a story. When you're in leadership, be careful about when people bring you half of a story. Make sure you investigate and find out the true motive of the person telling you that story. See, he wanted to take all of Mordecai's people out, and, he, and, and, and the devil's doing it like it's a game. He's rolling the dice or whatever number it lands on that I'm coming, that's the day I'm coming to get you. Like, come on, man. So then he goes to the king, of course, King Xerxes. And then he, like, King Xerxes was weak, in my opinion, because all, everybody knew how to pull his little string, how to get him mad. Verse nine said, if it pleases the king, I have a suggestion. Why are folks are always giving this king suggestions? Why can't he make things up for himself? Give a command to destroy these people. And I will put 750,000 pounds of silver into the king's treasury. This money could be used to pay the men who do these things. So not only is he out for them, he's going to make it easier on the king because he's going to fund and finance the disaster of the uh, Jews. So the king took the official ring, you take his official ring here, off his finger and gave it to Haman, the hangman. Haman was the enemy of the Jews. So pretty much when he took his ring off, he gave him his authority. So you really don't need to be serving under anyone who's going to give away their, ex their authority. See, we had that where one person that was in leadership over the country they would give their authority to someone else. Pretty much, I'm not going to denounce uh, racism. I'm not going to denounce uh, white supremacy. That's pretty much, by the way, I won't denounce it. I might as well have taken off my ring and said, here you go. You have my permission to do as you please. Then the king said to Haman, keep the money. Do what you want with it. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the king's secretaries were called. They wrote out all of Haman's commands in the language of each providence. And then they wrote them in the language of each group of people. They wrote to the king's satraps, the governors of the different provinces, and the leaders of the different groups of people. They wrote with the authority of the king Xerxes himself and sealed the commands with the king's own ring. So pretty much 
they they wrote all of these little hateful documents down that uh Heyman had came up with and then they sealed it and made it official so it, it's kind of like they they took some information and they tweeted it and then it went viral and you went to find out where it originated and there was a blue check so it was from a verified account so this it pretty much this is the truth it's going to happen verse 13 messengers carried all this is where it went viral they carried all the letters to all of the king's providences the letters were the king's command to ruin kill and completely destroy all the jews this meant young people and old people, women and little children too. The command was to kill all the Jews on a single day. The day was to be the 13th, which now we see as an unlucky number, 13th day of the 12th month of the month of Adar. And the command was to take everything that belonged to the Jews. This made a lot of Jews upset. A copy of the letter with the command was to be given as a law. It was to be a law in every providence and announced to the people of every nation living in the kingdom. Then everyone would be ready for that day. They pretty much uh, had the movie The Purge before there was cameras, before there was a movie set, before anything. This was The Purge. They was getting rid of the Jews. It was going to be on the 13th. Everybody knew about it, and they were preparing. So how do you feel if you're a Jew and you've done nothing wrong, and now you start seeing posts saying all Jews going to be killed on the 13th, and we're coming for your stuff. We're going to come for your stuff, and it's funded by the government. How would you feel if people felt like they can do something to you and the government would okay it. How would you feel? I know a lot of you are saying, I know how it feels because I'm black. So I know how it feels to feel like somebody can do something to me and get away with it. Now, everybody's not racist. Everybody's not doing things like that. But there are some people that know exactly how that feels. It doesn't feel good to feel like you can be violated you can be taken advantage of. You can be beaten. You can be killed, and nothing will be done about it. At the king's command, the messengers hurried off. The command was given in the capital city of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was in confusion. So we got mass confusion again. The king is out here drinking, but this 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 law has gone into place that's going to hurt a lot of the people who've done nothing let's move on to uh, chapter four when murder one more i said mordecai when mordecai heard about all that had been done he tore his clothes then he put on sackcloth put ashes on his head and went out into the city crying loudly but mordecai went only as far as the king's gate because no one was allowed to enter the gate dressed in sackcloth. See, this makes me think. You had to dress a certain way in order to enter the king's gate. So you had to look like something. It didn't really, it, there was no check on the inside. It was only what your outer appearance looked like. And that's how it is a lot in churches. It's all about how you look on the outside. How you, what do you have on? See, if you come in the church and you got on a three-piece suit and you boom, bam, bow, people are like, okay, they supposed to be here. But if you're the one that comes to church and you have on, you know, a, a sweatsuit or a smelly pair of jeans or you're sagging, or they're going to say that you're disrespecting and you're not honoring God's place of worship. Now, this can be true if you understand that you should come to God in a certain way. You should pay homage and you should honor him in his sight. However, I would much rather have the woman in the church who doesn't know how to appropriately dress 
than that same woman not coming into the church. Because how can you pour into that person? How can you teach that young man to pull his pants up, take your hat off when you're in the building, if you won't even allow him into the church? Think about it. It gets deeper. In every providence where the king's commands had come, there was much crying and sadness amongst the Jews. They were fasting and crying loudly. Many Jews were lying on the ground dressed in sackcloth with ashes on their head. Esther's slave women and eunuchs came to her to, to, to her about Mordecai. This made the Queen Esther very sad and upset. What did she do? She sent clothes for Mordecai to put on instead of the sackcloth, but he refused to accept them. And this is exactly what we do. When we see that someone is in trouble, we try to send our substance to help them. Instead of going to find out what's wrong, we just want to cover it up because we don't want that outside of our place. We don't want somebody outside of our building looking like that. We don't want the crackhead in our family. We don't want the drug addicted person in our family. So we don't talk about it. We don't want the child molester to be called out in our family or in our house. So we cover it up. What we do is we say, hey, when people come around, I need you to go take a bath. I don't want you smelling like liquor. I don't want people knowing. And we cover up our own sins and we cover up our own stuff, just like she tried to do. She just wanted to cover it up. She's the queen, keep in mind, so she can go out and find out what's wrong. This is the same person who's been there for her her whole life. But when he needed her, the first thing she did was she tried to buy him off. See, sometimes we think when we get a little bit of money in our pocket, when we get a couple degrees, that those degrees, that we can just fan them on people who are, who are in hot situations. I promise you, I got umpteen degrees. But when there's a hot situation, I need God. I don't need a degree. I don't need my master's. I don't need my bachelor's. I don't need my specialist. I need God to come see me out of that situation. So you got to stop treating the symptom and get down to the root of the problem. But see, Mordecai, he wasn't no fool. He didn't accept him. What did he say? Esther then called Hathbok, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been chosen to serve her. She commanded him to find out what was bothering Mordecai and why. So he went out to where Mordecai was in the open place of the city in front of the king's gate. Then Mordecai told Hathlock everything that had happened to him. Mordecai told him about the exact amount of money Haman had promised to put into the king's treasury for the killing of the Jews. Mordecai also gave Hathlock a copy of the king's commands to kill the Jews. The command had been sent out all over the city of Susa. He wanted Hethlock to show it to Esther and tell her everything. And he told him to encourage Esther to go to the king and beg him for mercy for the Mordecai and her, and her people. Why do, why does Mordecai have to beg the queen to look out for her own people. Why is it that some of our own people, when they come up, they will not look out for their people? It takes somebody on the street to beg them to look out for their own people. I, I want to answer. I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to wait. I'm waiting. You can type it. You can text me. I really want to know, why is it that when you have people going through situations, somebody has to tell you to help them. You're supposed to be the ram in the bush. That's what we pride ourselves on, helping others. But sometimes you get so caught up 
and helping everybody outside your house, everybody outside your family. You want to give to the to the needy. You want to go downtown. You want to send over three dollars a month to Africa. But you got folks in your own neighborhood. You got folks in your own family who can't keep on their lights, who doesn't have a meal. You got some people in your family who are homeless, but you don't care about them. You much rather send your money out to people you never meet. The biggest change you can make is the change right around you. Let that sink in. Then Esther told Heslock to say to Mordecai, Mordecai, all the king's leaders and all of the people of the king's provinces know this. The king has only one law. He only got one job. For any man or woman who goes to the king without being called, pretty much if I ain't sent for you, you better not come. That was the king's law. This person must be put to death unless the king holds out his gold scepter to them. If the king does this, that person's life will be saved. And I have not been called to go to see the king for 30 days. I don't know about that, but I'm not going to have a queen that I don't want to see for 30 days. I understand long distance relationship stuff happens. That ain't for me. 32 days. I'm like, where are you at? Anyhow, let's not get sidetracked. So now we find out why she really didn't want to go help. She felt like it would have been too much of a risk for her. It would have made her uncomfortable because she would have had to sacrifice something in order to help them. She possibly could lose her life. Now, now wait the options here. There's already a decree and a law put out that all the Jews are going to lose their life. And she's worried about possibly losing her own life. That's when you start looking like, do you not know you a Jew? The law, it, the, it's already right. Girl, you a Jew. Like your name ain't, uh, uh, you not from Decatur, you from Decatur. Like check yourself. Sometimes you get all up into the king's castle. You get all to having brunches and doing all this other stuff with them folks, them folks down there, and you forget who you are. The decree didn't say everybody but the queen. The decree said all the Jews. So what make your little musty butt think? Because you got some new heels, some red bottoms, a Dooney and Burke purse, and, 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 and some new leggings that you are exempt from this thing that's coming. Boo boo, you not, okay? And it's the same thing that Mordecai told her. Verse 12 says that Esther's message was given to Mordecai. When he got the message, Mordecai sent one back. I got time today. Huh. Esther, don't think that just because you live in the king's palace that you will be the only Jew to escape. You not going to escape because you a Jew, okay? If you keep quiet now, help and freedom for the Jews will come from another place. But you and your father's family will die. And who knows? Maybe you have been chosen to be the queen for a time like this. Let that resonate with you. If you don't do what you are called to do, somebody else will. If you don't do, let me say it a little bit louder for the folks that's playing on their phone, for the folks that's flicking through TikTok, that's scrolling through Facebook and just happen to be in this divine moment. God is speaking to you. If you don't do what you are called to do, Someone else will. Husbands, let's apply this across the board. That way we can hit every, every avenue. Husbands, if you don't do what you are called to do for your wife and your family, someone else will. Deliverance will come from somewhere else. Wives, if you do not do what you're called to do, 
as a wife, as a mother, as a sister, as a friend. Someone else will. Students, if you don't do your job, somebody else will. Athletes, love my athletes. If you don't get the job done, someone else will. A touchdown, a basket, a field goal, a pin on the mat, a hole in one will come from someone else. So don't get so high and mighty and think that you can't be replaced. We are all expendable. So don't get into your feelings so much thinking that you're untouchable. Every day when I wake up and I'm able to clock into my job, I am thankful because I understand that I have a desired position. Any position is desired, especially in the midst of a global pandemic with unemployment rates going up and up and up. So I don't ever take for granted being a head basketball coach in the high school level in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't take for granted being a PE teacher. When I walk into my job, I know I'm on my calling. I know I have an opportunity to deposit seeds of wisdom into those young people. I know I have an opportunity to, you know, further someone else's life and be an example for somebody else. Also understand that you have been chosen to be who you are for a time like this. It's right here at the end of verse 14. Maybe you have been chosen to be who you are for a time like this. What that means is, though, you got to be yourself. You can't be anybody else. If you be somebody else, first of all, God's going to find somebody to be who he called you to be, and you're going to miss out on your blessing. Sometimes I struggle with, is this ministry working? It's the T-shirt, sweatpants, jokes, the TikToks. Is it really working? Am I building the kingdom up? Why ain't I more like the bishop that sent me out? Why don't I have a talk like T.D. Jakes? Why can't I hoop like Bishop Rudy McKissick Jr.? Why ain't I, you know, talking like, the, you know, the, the pastor from Newburgh? But then I had to realize, maybe I am sent for a time like this. And if I don't be myself, there are a whole lot of Christians out there that are going to miss their mark because they're trying to figure out, can I be a Christian and still like sports? Can I be a Christian and drop a three and yell splash, get you some? Or is that talking junk? Can I be a Christian if I don't like wearing suits? Can I be a Christian if I only want to go to church online? Can I be a Christian if... I like to look fly if I like fancy clothes and nice cars. Ah, yes, you can. And there's a place for you in the kingdom. Continue. Then Esther sent this answer to Mordecai. Go and get all the Jews in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days and nights. I and my women servants will fast too. After we fast, I will go to the king. I know it is against the law to go to the king if he didn't call me, but I will do it anyway. If I die, I die. Once again, you got to get to a point that you are willing to sacrifice something for what you want. See, this was a mutual agreement here. She wasn't just going to go down there by herself. She said, look, if I'm going to go in front of this guy, who could kill me, y'all need to be fasting. So you need to deprive, you need to have a sacrifice too. It ain't just going to be me. It's going to be a two-way street here. And that's how it has to be. You got to get in partnership with people who have your back. Stop getting in partnership with people who sit back and watch for you to do it. I'm going to wait for you to do it. I'm going to wait for you. Uh, no, you got to go half and half sometimes. Sometimes you got to go 100. It may be 75, 25, but
but you got to be willing to sacrifice something. You got to have somebody on your team that's willing to sacrifice as well. So Mordecai went away and he did everything that Esther told him to do so. Let's go on. We'll go to one more chapter. On the third day, this is chapter four, Esther put on her special robe. So she got to fly, y'all. Remember they said she was fine. Keep in mind. And then she stood inside the area of the king's palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his throne in the hall facing the place where the people entered the room. So just imagine the king here up there, probably drunk or thinking about getting drunk or getting just, you know, coming off a hangover from being drunk. And he look up and he see this fine woman who is his wife standing there in some fine clothes. Nice robe, the special, the good robe. When he saw Queen Esther standing in that court, when he saw her, it said he was very pleased. He held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther went to the room and went near the king. And then she touched the end of the king's gold scepter. He would be a fool not to. He see this fine woman standing out there and this these nice uh, boy put that thing out there. Come on. It, he stood it straight out. I'm, I'm in the word. He put it out there. She came and kissed it. And then the king asked, What's bothering you, Queen Esther? What do you want to ask me? I will give you anything you ask for, even half my kingdom. There we go with that flexing. That's what we do. Baby girl, what you need? Girl, you can have everything. What, what you need? Standing there looking like a snack. You can have whatever. You can have half my kingdom. See, a real woman doesn't want half your kingdom. She wants you. Note, take the note, take the note, take the note. Esther said, I have prepared a party for you and Haman. Will you and Haman please come to the party today? And then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do what Esther asked. So the king and Haman went to the party Esther had prepared for them. That man, he answered quick. See, women, wives, queens. I'm not talking about the nun wives. I'm talking about the queens here. Some of y'all ain't queens. If your feelings hurt, it's probably you. Because if you know your queen, your queen is. But when you ask something in a certain way, that man will run to do what you ask him to do. If you come with a nasty attitude, they're not going to be in a rush to see. He might not even help to say, man, she would have came to think, Xerxes, are you in there? I got to talk to you. What if she came like that? Do you think he would have had the same response? What if she didn't, you know, bring her best self? See, when you go in front of the king, this is for everybody, make sure you present your best self. When you go in front of your boss, when you go in front of your administration, when you go in front of your leadership, make sure that you are presenting the best version of yourself. Don't expect for someone to invest in you if you won't invest in yourself. If you won't take care of yourself, once again, self-care is not selfish. Verse 6. While they were drinking wine, always drinking, the king asked her, Now, Esther, what do you want to ask for? Ask anything. I will give it to you. So what is it that you want? I will give you anything up to half of my kingdom. Esther answered, This is what I want to ask for. If the king is pleased with me, you know he is, and thinks it is good to give me what I ask for, let the king and Haman come tomorrow. I will prepare another party for them. Then I will tell you what I really want. So right now, he like, another party? Yeah. Haman's anger at Mordecai. Haman left the king's palace that day very happy and in a good mood. But he saw Mordecai at the king's gate. He became very angry 
Haman was very mad at him because Mordecai didn't show any respect when Haman walked by. Mordecai was not afraid of Haman, and this made Haman mad. See, some people are mad at you because you're not afraid of them. Some people are mad at you because you're not afraid of them. Because you only fear a God, they're mad at you. See, I said it in the sermon, but I'll say it again. Nobody should have such power and control over you that you left the kingdom. You left from a, a, a party with the king, which means you're doing good right now. Nobody should have that much power over you that when you see them, just because they're not mad at you, their presence makes you upset just because they're not afraid of you. How does someone have so much power over you that just their presence changes your whole mood? It shouldn't be that way. But Haman controlled his anger. And then Haman called together his friends and his wife's the rest. Haman started bragging about how rich he was. He was bragging to his friends about how many sons, about all the ways the king had honored him. And he was bragging about how the king had promoted him higher than all the other leaders. So the man, he was on his stuff. He's at the top of his game right now. He's been promoted. He got sons. He got him a wife. He got all of that. So why don't he just leave the Jews alone? See, if God has blessed you, why do you got to mess with somebody else when they get blessed? Don't let your jealousy, your hate, your envy, and your anger be the downfall of you. And that's not all. Haman added, I am the only one that Queen Esther invited to be with the king at the party she gave. And the queen also had invited me to be with the king again tomorrow. This makes me think, sometimes when people brag about themselves, it's to make themselves feel better. Because he was happy, and then he got mad, and now he had to say something to pump himself back up. I got this, I got that. But all this means nothing to me. If I cannot be happy as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. Like, bruh, he ain't even in the gate. He on the outside. How you hating on somebody from outside the club? Tell me. This man is outside the club. He ain't even in the members only section. Dude waiting at the he at the gate can't even come in. And, and that make you that mad? Like, come on. Get over yourself. Then Haman, wife, Zeresh, and all his friends had a suggestion. Here we go suggesting stuff again. They said, tell someone to build a post to hang him on. Make it 75 feet tall. And in the morning, ask the king to hang on, to hang Mordecai on it. Then go to the party with the king and you can be happy. Haman liked this suggestion. So he ordered someone to build a hanging post. So you got Haman taking the advice of his friends and his wife. And they tell him, since you don't like him, since he makes you angry, then you hang him. It makes no sense to me while the man could be on the top of his game, he could be blessed and highly favored, as we say, and you're so worried about Haman that you're going to murder this man for not being afraid of you. So let's recap here. He was mad. He, as in Haman, was upset because one Jew did not respect him. One Jew did not fear him. So he had a law written because he went to his homeboy, King Xerxes, and got his ring and stamped this law in 
roll the dice like it was just like you're an animal. I'm gonna roll the dice, pick the date. They was gonna kill all the Jews, and decide that all the Jews are gonna die. And then you had Mordecai and the rest of the Jews mad, sad as they should be. Now you got high and mighty Queen Esther, who had to get knocked back in her place, thinking that she was gonna be okay because. She's not like them. She's one of the good ones. She's in the kingdom. No, boo. You a target too. You just don't know it. And then he finally talks some sense into his niece. So she decides that she has to go talk to the king. And she does. But she comes the right way. And now you have an upset Haman leaving this party happy. And he gets mad when he sees Mordecai, just sitting, just sitting, being himself. People get mad at you for being yourself. And now he goes home to his wife and friends after bragging on himself and saying, none of all the stuff I got matters because I'm mad at Mordecai. So they give him the advice to create a post to hang Mordecai on. This story is not going to end well. I don't want to jump into next week, but I can tell you, it's not going to end well. Make sure you tune in. But you just have to be careful. I'll leave you with this little wisdom nugget and I'll get out your way. Be very careful that you don't allow someone else to steal your joy. Because this situation was completely avoidable. And I think God gave him plenty of opportunities to leave that man alone. Even though God wasn't mentioned, when you don't have God in your decision-making process, you make bad decisions. You're about to hang a man for not being afraid of you. Don't add up. It don't add up. I hope you enjoy. I hope you learn. I hope this sticks with you. If you want to donate, you want to give an offering, be the ram.com backslash give it. You want to buy a shirt or two, be the ram.com backslash store. If you want to give on Cash App, it's BTR Global. Either way, I want you to visit that website. Let us pray, God. We pray for all those right now who have hate in their heart. There's somebody under the sound of my voice who may have been holding on to a grudge so much that they can enjoy their life. God, release them from that right now. Give them the peace to move forward because they can't go on with their life and be successful because they're being tied back to something that happened in the past. And just like Haman, you're giving them opportunity after opportunity to let it go. There is a blessing in letting go. You got to forgive. You got to forget. You got to move on. But God, we need the strength to move on. Continue to bless us. We pray for all those right now who are suffering from COVID-19. Please be with them in the hospital bed. Be with their families who are waiting and nervous. Do not let anxiety take over. God, we pray for all of the teachers right now. They are stressed out. They've had enough. Give them a mental break. We pray for the families who have lost someone. We pray for all of the members of Be The Ram Global Fellowship and their families. Right now, we pray for that young man who's going through a divorce. God, he just wants to see his kids. No, he's not perfect and she's not perfect, but you will perfect any situation, God. So I ask you to be with them in Texas right now. I ask that you would just cause a wind of change to flow through their minds. God, change that woman's heart, change her mind, and allow things to go smoothly. God, bring it back together if it should be. God, show them where they went wrong because they are stronger together than they could ever be apart. God is not about them, it is about the kingdom. 
that's going to come, the blessings that are going to come because of that marriage, it is the devil that doesn't want them together. So right now I am speaking, I am decreeing and declaring that you will put them back together again. God, if anybody can do it, you can. So we come to you and we ask that you touch that family. You touch their minds. You touch their hearts. God, we pray for the sinners in the backsliders, God. It's all of us at some point because we're not perfect. We just ask that you continue to, to chisel off those addictions, chisel off those things that bother us and perfect us. God, bless us in our coming and our going. We thank you for this few five minutes. And until next time, we just ask you to cover us and keep us safe and healthy. Amen. Now, I thank you for being with us. I ask that you visit our website. I ask that you share this with someone. And I just ask you to be a blessing to somebody. This is Pastor Coach McKissick of Be The Round Global Fellowship. And until next time, I challenge you to win the 97% and be the ram of somebody's life. Amen.